you've impressed us all already. <laughs> I was having trouble with it um, earlier today where I was, I like went in full screen, but it wasn't um, working that way. So I'm glad that if I change my slides, you can see that. So we should be all set. Cool. All we need is a meeting now and we'll be all set. Two minutes, David. I know I'm being impatient and I'm, I thinking sorry. about food. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, maybe, I'm thinking about maybe, my Maybe you, know you should have a snack before these meetings. I don't like snacking. It doesn't serve me. I like having my dinner at a reasonable hour, like 8 or 8.30. Not 9.30. That's, I think that's a little bit, you know, over the top, even for me. Gosh, I ate dinner like an hour ago. <laughs> well, how old are your kids? <laughs> yeah. They're five. Right. Exactly. There you go. It's good for your digestion. Yeah. All right. So one, two, three. Speaking of my kids. <sighs> long day well it was actually punctuated by some very good things i went to price chopper to get lobster for 10.99 a pound and they had a fill in there a man who didn't know the you know the ropes so he gave me two lobsters that were over two pounds a piece for for the price of a one and a quarter pound lobster 10.99 so wow. we're going to have lobster and probably lobster salad as a leftover yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. Yeah. I have to start getting it there. They check the prices every week because sometimes Hannaford is better and, you know, sometimes <clears throat> Shopper. Every once in a while, ShopRite. I like ShopRite's fish. We actually have some very good fish. I get almost all of my fish from the farmer's market. It's really good. It's very fresh and well, David, I learned the fish woman is only coming once a month now this year at the farmer's market. Okay. You're going to have to stock up. Right. Well, go to, go to the Kingston market. Oh, yeah. I don't get I don't get out that far. All right. I have 701. Do we have enough people here? One, yeah, two, three. Okay. We have four. Okay. So I am calling this meeting of the Woodstock Environmental Commission to order. It is June second at 7.01 p.m. Uh, present, we have Julia, myself, Arlene, Robert, David, and guests, Laura, Ken, and Angelina. Hi. Um, did everyone get a chance to see the agenda? I move to adopt the agenda. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And did everyone get a chance to check out the minutes from last week? Mm -hmm. Yes. Who <laughs> to adopt the minutes is written. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, correspondence, none to speak of, but I have an announcement, which is that uh, our next meeting is June 16th. And if everyone is feeling good about this, um, Jackie has given us our place back in the town offices so we can resume our 7 p.m. Wednesdays as I they remember. always have been. She thought that at the very least if there, you know, if, if like we had a real lot of people and we wanted to move outside or something, we have that option. Um, but that'll be back in action. Sounds good to me. Ken allowed to drink wine at the in the uh, um, in the main office in the main office. Am, am I allowed? Coke drink? bottle. I'm sorry. What Coke bottle? It's on a Coke bottle. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fine. 
Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other announcements? Yeah. Well, Alex, I just want to mention that the Cuomo does have the gazebo. So if people did have the desire to go outside. The gazebo seats about 14, although you're shoulder to shoulder if you put 14 people in it. But if you didn't want to be outside, the gazebo is a choice. Cuomo? Cor correct. Up at the town offices. Oh, you mean the Camo? No, sorry, Como. C Como. Yeah. Como. <laughs> There's no. Como, Perry Como. I'm sorry, shut up, David. Okay, never mind. Sorry. All right. Ken, do you have any announcements? I know last time you felt like you didn't get a chance to make your announcements. Oh, I sent you my announcements. It came under correspondence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if we are all set then. Um, so Angelina is here, and I'm, I don't know how to pronounce your last name correctly, Angelina. So maybe when you introduce yourself, you can teach me. Um, and she is going to speak to us a little bit about composting and um, some of the options that we kind of have. She's with the Ulster County Resource Recovery Agency. Um, I do very well. And, uh, you know, we've been talking, something we've been talking about for a long time, sort of like dipping our toes in and thinking about it. So, um, I'm, I'm eager to hear what you have to share with us. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Um, Angelina Peony, kind of like the flower, but not quite. Um, and it's my pleasure to join the commission uh, this evening and have the opportunity to speak about organics recycling and specifically about our uh, composting operation at UCRA. Um, as the Director of Sustainability, I have the pleasure of being a liaison to the community for all things recycling, composting, and zero waste. Um, and composting is one of my favorite topics to dive into, so super excited. And on a personal note, um, just I wanted to mention that I am a lifelong resident of Socrates, so uh, I feel like I'm part of the sister community, uh, Woodstock Socrates, and um, the environmental, very familiar with the environmental ethos of, of the community, and really excited to be able to plug in today and talk about composting. So I'm going to share my screen. I did prepare a few slides. Um, so I'm going to aim for about 15 minutes, um, maybe a little bit less because I tend to go quickly. And uh, excited to hear your questions and any um, comments that you have as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share. You should be viewing my screen if you can give me a thumbs up, Alex. Perfect. So um, this is our slogan at UCRA for our composting initiatives. Um, connecting communities through composting, grow Ulster Green, because we feel that um, composting is a central component of Ulster County's climate smart goals and nurturing stewardship of our natural resources here. So we're, we plan to grow Ulster Green with composting. And we also say that we're connecting communities through composting because we understand that composting programs are really systems and they're about building relationships between people and places and um, making meaningful connections with people to uh, build ecological literacy. So we hope that uh, Woodstock will join us in this mission to grow Ulster Green. And I put together a slide. Um, so it's always helpful to share some background information about UCRA. We've been proudly serving Ulster County for over 30 years, but I'm always amazed at um, the sometimes the lack of awareness about our organization. So UCRA or UCRA, as you might hear me say, is a solid waste authority and a public benefit corporation. And our mission is to promote sustainable materials management in Ulster County with a focus on resource conservation. And we operate two permitted facilities. One is located in New Paltz, and this is an aerial view of our larger facility in Kingston on Flatbush Road. Um, notably, I have pointed out here a couple of our programs that we offer in pursuit of our mission. We receive all of the municipal solid waste that's generated in the county. We have a dual stream recycling program and we offer many other programs in pursuit of our mission but today we'll be talking about our composting program and I uh, hope to address some other questions you may have about your other composting options here in Ulster County. 
Now, I suspect that the audience today has a good working knowledge and awareness about the benefits of composting, but I did want to kind of frame our conversation by talking about these environmental, horticultural, and social benefits of organics recycling. 40% uh, of food grown in the US is never eaten. That's 20 pounds of food per person per month, making up 15% of the total waste stream nationwide um, after recovery and recycling. Food waste is 22% of the material that gets buried in landfills. So the largest component of what is going uh, to waste in the landfill is organics that 100% could be diverted, recovered, and recycled. And organics in the landfill, because they're biodegradable, they degrade anaerobically to generate methane, a potent greenhouse gas. And um, you know all of these things could be easily avoided by recovering uh, source reduction, donating food that's edible for people, recovering food that's edible for farm for livestock on farms, and and composting as one of those. Um, options at the bottom of that sustainability hierarchy. And when we recycle food scraps into compost, it has many ecological and horticultural benefits, which I won't dive too much in. This is just kind of a broad overview, but um, compost is essential to improving local soil health uh, and growing healthy plants so we can continue to, to grow healthy foods. And in addition, I did want to comment that Composting um, can help a community and a business save money on avoided waste disposal costs. So here in Ulster County at our facility, uh, trash is $105 per ton. And if you have source separated organics, the fee is $20 per ton. So there's a substantial cost differential there that is very intentional so that we can encourage more participation um, in composting. So our organics recovery facility began as a small pilot project in 2012. We scaled up in 2016 after seeing the success of the program and the level of participation from businesses, schools, and municipalities. Um, so we are a fully established industrial scale composting operation right, right there in Kingston. Um, and looking to the future, we are always looking for new innovations and new ways to expand. And one of our goals and my personal goal is to nurture local participation in this program. Um, over the past few years, we have had a lot of food waste, or you might hear me call it food scraps. Food scraps that's coming to us from outside of Ulster County. And I think it's important for our goal to maximize the benefits of our own waste stream that we have more local communities participating in composting. And we're extremely proud of these benefits that we've achieved. Uh, this is a slide that I really love to share. So since 2012, since the start of our composting program, UCRA has transformed 19,000 tons of food scraps into a local and sustainable compost product. Now, if this food were to be taken to the landfill, uh, which is in Seneca Meadows, New York, almost 500 miles round trip, it would have filled 555 tractor trailer transport vehicles, uh, driving accumulatively 266,000 miles, which is enough to wrap around the world 10.6 times. So the carbon um, impact here is huge. If we can take out this highly recyclable portion of the waste stream, that's almost a third of all of our waste, and recycle it right here in our own backyard, um, you know, we're, we're going to have incredible benefits, not only from landfill diversion, but for improving soil health. So since the life cycle of this composting program, the greenhouse gas equivalent is uh, analogous to burning 35 million pounds of coal or enough electricity electricity use to power 5,800 homes, or the carbon sequestration of 40,000 acres of US forest per year. So we're extremely proud of this, and we want um, as many folks out there to join us in our mission, because um, we, we have a lot of work to do. We can do even more. So how can you get involved? We invite businesses and schools and municipalities to join what we call our Partners in Composting Program, which is a formal process that we have to kind of onboard and train and work collaboratively with local facilities to implement these types of composting programs that bring food scraps to our facility in Kingston, where we like to say we transform trash into treasure. Um, 
So I'll share some general comments about our operation, and then um, I'll end today with a little bit more details about this three-step process and what some other options are. We use a technology called Extended Aerated Static Pile Method of Composting, or EASP. Uh, and this was a technology selected for its many benefits, which I won't go into grave detail, but essentially how it works is uh, food scraps are delivered to our site, so we don't do any hauling. If they're delivered to our site, we mix those food scraps with a bulking agent or uh, wood chips that we grind on site. And um, then that mixture is layered onto a network of perforated pipes. And these perforated pipes are connected to blowers that force ambient air into this massive pile of biomass. And that controls the decomposition, controls the moisture. Um, it reaches very high thermophilic composting temperatures, which kill weed seeds, plant pests, pathogens for many food scraps, et cetera. So that's an active composting cycle of 30 days, after which we remove all that material from the aeration zones, and they are laid to rest in long windrow piles for an additional 60 days, and the compost will cool as it ages, and um, some of the biological activity will slow down, the pH of the compost will go down, and then after 60 days, that compost is saleable, and we screen it to a fine 3 8 inch size, and it's sold in bulk, unblended. Now, we sell our compost for general use. It's available to farmers, to landscapers, to gardeners, and to the average Joe. So it's very important that we make the highest quality compost possible. We like to say we need clean feedstocks in so we can make that quality compost on the back end of the operation. So you can see we have a wide list of acceptable items, including all food scraps, both pre-consumer, meaning uh, from the preparation of a meal in the back of a kitchen and post-consumer food scraps, meaning plate scrapings or after someone has consumed some of the meal. We can take meat, fish, bones, and dairy products and all of those food scraps that are problematic in small scale systems, we have absolutely no problem managing at our scale. Um, vegetable trimmings, bulk produce, bakery overages, I won't read that whole thing. Um, but the important thing here to highlight is the items we do not accept. So we do not accept some of these food service contaminants like hairnets, gloves, condiment packs, um, rubber bands, twist ties, utensils, pizza boxes, miscellaneous paper products. Those are what we consider contaminants. And I will tell you right now, the key to a successful composting program is having a robust program that will fight contamination from the beginning, the middle, and the end, all the way through uh, how you implement your, your program. Um, contamination, contamination, contamination. So for ease and convenience to our partners, we offer a variety of tools, including these posters, which are colorful, they're kind of easy to read. We're working on translating these into Spanish. Um, and these just kind of emphasize our commitment to quality. We try to make it really clear. Green is good and red is no. Please don't. Because, um, again, contamination is um, a, a very serious issue in any composting program. So um, I will speak a little bit about compostable packaging. Uh, consumers are increasingly uh, have increasing access to a variety of different types of packaging which are labeled biodegradable or eco-friendly or uh, sometimes they're even labeled compost compostable but there are certain specifications that a industrial scale composting operation needs to meet certain criteria with the types of packaging it can accept. And because there is so much greenwashing and mislabeling here, we are very strict about the types of compostable packaging that we will allow. We recognize that um, these packages and products play an important role in achieving waste reduction uh, for certain types of businesses or community events. But there is a general lack of regulation on the labeling, which is very confusing. Um, and there's uh, other concerns. I won't dive more into detail unless you have specific questions about that. Um, but we do accept them. We try to work very hard. Um, very closely and early on with our partners to make sure you have the correct types of packaging that we can process. 
And again, this is all for the love of the finished product. We sold 2,676 tons of compost in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic, which is a wonderful thing. And uh, in pursuit of our mission to make the best quality compost that we can, we are members of the US Composting Council and we participate in their seal of testing assurance program. So all of our compost is tested quarterly by a certified uh, soil science laboratory approved by the Composting Council. And then all of our technical data sheets for the physical, chemical, and biological specifications of the compost is made public on our website. So you can just visit ucrra.org slash compost for sale, and you can look up and see for yourself, uh, very transparent about um, what's in our compost and what the specifications are. So how do you join this program and get involved in all these wonderful benefits? Um, it's generally a three-step process. Um, it, the timeline is different for each type of partner. We like to give a very specific attention based on the specific needs of the site or the facility. Um, but the first step is to contact us, right? Reach out to us. We have a questionnaire that we use to gather important information. It's kind of like a survey. Um, we invite uh, those partners to our facility for a tour and a meeting so that we can kind of get to know them. They can kind of get to know us. And that way we can identify any program opportunities, what your goals are, what your needs might be, and how we can help you. So step two is to come up with a strategic plan. So it's very important to think ahead, right, about contamination. So how will participants be educated? Um, and when participants, I mean kitchen staff or cafeteria diners, um, staff, volunteers, the general public, uh, you know, who's your audience, who's going to be participating in this, and how are they going to be trained? And what level of training would you like to provide? Do you want them just to know what to do, or do you want to provide um, additional education about the benefits of composting. Um, and then some logistical considerations, right? Where will your stations be placed? It should be very strategic. Where, uh, what will the bins look like? What color will they be? Will they be labeled? Do you have posters? Do you have a brochure that someone can take home or something on your website people can look up? Who should they call if they have questions? Who's responsible for what? Those are all parts of <clears throat> the strategic plan that you need to flesh out. And once we're really comfortable with you know, your, your goals and your next steps, then we'll set up an account for you to have access to our composting program and all the resources. And like I mentioned before, this starts an ongoing relationship, even though it's a three-step process, we'll always give continuous feedback about the quality of your um, loads coming in, if they're contaminated or if they're looking great. We have uh, ongoing stakeholder engagement. If you need more training, if you have changes in staff, we want to give you everything you need to maintain that success. So our partners in composting receive a suite of all kinds of uh, great tools that they can use. So uh, free guidebooks, consultation services on that strategic planning I mentioned, um, educational staff training, logistical support. So we'll help come in and train uh, the kitchen staff or the volunteers at a festival, et cetera. We have posters, bin stickers, window decals to put on the, the front of your business. Um, we have a tote bin loan program that's available. So even if you need the bins to put the food scraps in, we do have a, an option for that. Um, annual statistics and metrics available. So you can share your sustainability story. We'll calculate all of that wonderful um, greenhouse gas emissions data for you and provide that to you and, and more things coming soon. Um, and then this is just some snips from our social media. And I do hope that if you're interested in uh, staying connected, that you'll follow our stories on Instagram and Facebook at UCRRA. Uh, here we are highlighting our partnership with Bread Alone. Um, here is a uh, example of what it looks like, basically, when our partners deliver the food scraps. It, we have a range of different vehicles and different levels of um, collection that comes to our utilize our site. Uh, but this is generally what it what it kind of looks like. And as part of our recycling outreach team at UCRA, we are your community resource for composting. So as I mentioned, if you are interested in learning, uh, regardless of a business or an organization or a group wants to use our specific service. We just want to see more participation in, in composting because we have that shared interest and that shared goal. So uh, in pursuit of that, we do have a variety of contact lists on our website. Uh, again, that's ucra.org. We have a master list of all the 
food waste management services, including all the local haulers and all the local compost sites that are available um, to the general public. And I hope that you do uh, visit us and take advantage of some of these fun booklets that we have. Again, we have free guidebook for any business, municipality, school, or facility that's interested in zero waste. And we can mail those out um, or you can view them as a PDF online. And I'll throw my contact info up there um, with Charles Whitaker, who's our Director of Operations. And I look forward to um, any questions in the Q&A in the chat. I have not been watching them yet, but I'll just leave this slide up for a moment so I can um, you can take my contact information and know that we're a resource for you. Super excited. Thanks again, Alex. Thank you. I don't, I don't know if we're a big asking questions in the chat box group. So there might be some questions that someone wants to just shout out, but I would like to start if that's okay. Um, because I'm, I'm curious to know if you could give us just a little bit of an explanation of what it looks like when, it, when this is done by a, a town, you know, something sort of similar to what we might be interested in. Um, if you have any examples you could kind of walk us through slightly and how they've done it or how it would work for us? Absolutely. So um, basically you have one track or one, one approach, which is to try to compost material on site somewhere, which can be achieved through a type of community garden where I've seen them um, co-located sometimes at other types of community centers or oftentimes maybe a um, religious group like a congregation or a church has some sort of space that they want to have a community garden and it's kind of um, well suited for that type of community center where you already have a group of volunteers that are very active and involved in there all the time that can maybe have a training program. So anyone who wants to participate in the community garden can take a short training class about composting. So they have the skill, some skills and savvy knowledge, and then members can, um, you know, start bringing that material to a place where you're composting on site. Another kind of track that communities um, often do is you have um, a centralized point of collection where community members can bring their food scraps to drop off or food scrap drop off collection center or that's not very catchy, but that's what it is. Um, and those can be places like a farmer's market or maybe a place like another community center, like I mentioned, like a congregation or a church or some type of um, staple of the community. I've also seen them kind of yet like libraries, um, which is interesting, or uh, co-located again at like a community garden type of situation where um, people are subscribing, right, to a service. So in order to get your composting kit in your bucket, you have to do this, this, and this, right? You're, we're training you, you have to attend, watch this video, uh, fill out this thing, read this book, so you know what to do. So they have a little bit of instruction to go home and start collecting their food scraps. And then that material would be congregated at that location and then brought to another composting location offsite. And I mentioned, I've spoken at length about our facility, but we also have uh, other composting operations in, in Ulster County. And those are all listed on our master contact list. Um, so those are just two kind of scenarios where you have uh, on-site management or you have a hybrid model where you have some sort of collection and then that material is taken off-site. Now, I mentioned that we see a variety of different types of vehicles and levels of service at our facility. So, you know, the, we've seen, um, you know, we have box trucks that come with tote bins, you know, filled with food scraps from, from these types of collection programs in other communities, notably Westchester. Um, Scarsdale has a wonderful collection program. They bring us their food scraps. So if you're looking to model a program like that, then I would, you know, recommend looking at that. Um, so we have box trucks, we have U-Hauls, like people rent vans for the day, the day that they're going to bring the food scraps. We've seen pick like pickup trucks um, just with the tote bins, like, you know, tied down with um, bungee cords and things like that. And then you just tip the bit, like tip the bin, the toter bin off the edge of the truck. 
it does take a little bit of muscle because those bins get really heavy once they're full. So we've seen all types of augmenting to these vehicles where they have like those gate lifts um, for like a, to raise a wheelchair onto a van or something like that. So you could use something like that to like pick up tote bins onto a truck. Um, so you really don't need a full scale like uh, garbage truck to do this. We've, you know, the, we've seen all these different types of scenarios and creativity. There's also enclosed trailers, which is like, um, a, like a it hitches onto any pickup truck, but it's fully enclosed. Some people use them to like, if you have a four wheeler and you're going to drive it into this like enclosed, um, compartment, those work really well. And currently, uh, at UCRA, we are looking at scenarios where we might be able to um, purchase some of those through a grant that we could distribute to certain town transfer stations or other municipalities that are interested to participate in this type of composting, but they don't have a mechanism to like bring it to us. So we are kind of looking at that as an organization right now as another opportunity to, again, look to the future and add another level to our service. Um, so- yeah, but bottom line is you do actually um, uh, take food scraps collected by municipalities and, um, uh, and and use those. I'd gotten the impression from somewhere that the uh, the program was primarily oriented towards school cafeterias and large companies like Bread Alone, um, where they um, uh, where, where the uh, well, obviously you have uh, a little bit more control over the type of materials that are uh, deposited at your site. Um, but you, you, you will actually t just take um, um, uh, domestic waste collected by municipalities and, um, and, uh, and if we can deliver them to you. Yeah, we have had all sorts of partners that are working with us. Um, you're correct that we do have a couple of schools and we love to see that um, because the children are a future and we need them to learn about yeah, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, trying to belittle your, um, uh, your efforts and that kind of thing. I'm just clarifying a misunderstanding on my part. No, we well, are. No, I've been told, see, Angelina, I've been told by UCRA uh, executives that cars are not allowed to come in with compost to be g given to the composting facility. Uh, the theory is that it'll be that, that you know I can't drive and uh, one of the trucks will squish me like a bug. Um, yeah, that's true, but, David. We yeah. have restricted access to small passenger cars. So, so what's the, what, is the, what is the um, actual rule? What is allowed in, and what wh what's the dividing line? The Partners in Composting program is no, for no, com like vehicles. commercial scale collection. But what what kind of vehicles are allowed in and where's the dividing line between what's allowed and what's not allowed? So our traffic pattern through our permit with the Department of Environmental Conservation restricts access on Saturdays for small passenger cars only. So if so for that reason, we don't have residents who just have like a five gallon pail at a time coming to bring food scraps. So it's limited to like large commercial vehicles exactly for the reason that you um, explained, David, that we have a lot of large equipment and traffic flow patterns and a lot of other things going on at the site. So, um, you know, we have to have larger vehicles that are coming to the composting. Um, yes. is it, is it in, in summary, is it fair to say you accept um, uh, materials from your partner program and not from random people? Yes. Is that, is that the dividing so, line? Yes, that's what I thought. So, so you, if, you have a certain. If Alex wanted to come with just a bucket of food, yep. we're not set up for that. It no, has no, no, to no. be large volume of um, yeah. material that's been aggregated. And, right. and it's not limited to schools um, and large businesses. We have municipalities, town transfer stations that are bringing us. Um, organics. We have community events, like notably the Clear Water Festival is a, is a zero waste event that's been working with us for many years. Um, we have some uh, religious congregations that have uh, an event once a year, right, and bring, and bring us material. So the, the scope of who it's open to is for, it's for large volumes, so not like a five-gallon bucket at a time. We are not set up for that. Um, but if it's aggregated together right and we have a little bit more control i think you were alluding to that of who's mm. collecting and how they're trained yeah. if it's part mm -hmm. of a larger organization or system that yeah you emphasize quality control on the materials you take and that's for obvious reasons and that would obviously be much more difficult to do if you just took waste from the general public 
I mean, the, no, the quality material. Yeah, the quality no, materials put in the recycling bin um, uh, will show you that there's a lot of what's called recycling. I might mention a year ago we had Mary McNamara here from the Socrates uh, Recycling Center talking about uh, their composting problem uh, program, which Woodstock is uh, is part of. I mean, we take our compost over to uh, to Socrates and leave it there. And I think we more need meet the 20 pounds a person per month <laughs> criteria. So, yeah, so, so Angela, it sounds almost like if we had a list of who all are your partners, you know, maybe which side would want to be a partner, but on the other hand, it might be easier if I have a five gallon bucket of my own personal stuff. If I knew a list of who your partners were, maybe if a partner was willing to accept people like myself bringing the stuff in, if we had a list of partners who might accept our individual stuff, that may be another way to get into it. I don't know if you have any partners that are willing to accept individual household to add to their, you know, aggregate. Laura, that's what Socrates does. That's what Socrates is. Well, Ken, are you talking about the, the transfer station and, and the, uh, the, the, the the bin at the transfer station for food waste? Or is there yeah, something I else? So. I, so. I send my son out there. I don't actually go. Especially during but, August. Kind but, of time. Does he go to the helpful. transfer station? This is helpful for me to hear from you because it sounds like maybe your goal is to reach residents and not necessarily to provide for for restaurants and cafes. Am I understanding that? Yeah. So I think a scenario like those first two that I mentioned, where there's a there's a, some type of community space for on-site composting, um, is very attractive. Or if you can aggregate the material at like a farmer's market or some other type of community center. Um, then that opens you up to a lot more opportunities. Yeah, but my question though was, do you have a list of places like the Sogarty's transfer station where uh, if we didn't start up our own place in Woodstock, is there a place, do you have a list of places already that I might take my five gallon bucket of stuff too? So I guess Sogarty's is one as everybody's just said. Is there a list of other places who might accept my five gallon bucket of stuff? So I can talk about the residential composting options, sure. So. Again, these are on our master contact list, which I can link in the chat or I can follow up with you, Alex, to make sure you know where to find that on our website. But so the Socrates Transfer Station has a program for open to residents, regardless of if they live in Socrates or not. Um, the town of Rochester Transfer Station has, this, has the same program, but I believe it's open to Rochester residents. The uh, town of Marbletown Transfer Station has a residential drop-off program, but I believe it's limited to residents of that town. Uh, the town of New Paltz has a residential uh, food scrap drop-off program, and I do believe that they would take out-of-town residents there. And then there is a collection site at the City of Kingston Farmers Market, which is a subscription service. So um, all of those scenarios I just mentioned, you have pay to have access to that composting program. So those are the residential composting options that are currently available. And Angelina, what about if we were in, you know, we have a lot of restaurants here, for example, um, or at least for a smaller ish town. Um, have you seen a model, you know, if we wanted to either facilitate or encourage restaurants to become involved in a program like this, um, is there anything that you could tell us about going about that? I mean, is there is there a way to, to potentially help facilitate that to, um, you know, explain to them what I'm just, you know, I don't, I maybe there are. Alex, Alex, can yeah. I butt in? Can I butt in? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we've been going around and around on this, this very issue for I don't know how many years. It's at least 10, probably 15, 20 years. Uh, my wife was part of a group that uh, started in Woodstock called Wow, Woodstock Organic Waste. And what we keep coming into always the answer is the problem is always money. Just follow the money. It's more expensive for a restaurant to compost than to not compost. You can talk about how they're reducing the amount of uh, garbage that goes into landfill and pays a higher tipping fee, but there's a their perception is that they need to have an employee who's monitoring this, the, the uh, source point separation. Is that what you call it? The, whatever. To make sure that 
nothing goes into the comp the uh, compost bin but compost and then they have to they don't get a hell of a reduction for for the the uh, the weight that they save by taking the foods the, the organic waste out of the waste stream uh what they have to do is pay another hauler to haul it away so it ends up costing them more at least in their perception you know, i mean i personally believe that if you took a fine dining restaurant um you would really have about a household garbage can of non-organic waste every week and everything else would be organic take a like a restaurant like any of the good restaurants in town like red onion just one example out of the, 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 the only non-organic waste they have is the plastic bags the carrots come in everything else is organic waste and com and totally compostable but they just don't see it that way so they think they have to have another employee or one poor, you know half of an employee and then they have to have another hauler and that's it's always about the money and if you can solve the money problem you've solved the game you've got it done oh, Slam so, I'm, so i'm curious just to hear if it's happened anywhere or if or if that has been addressed or how people are doing it. I mean, maybe someone has come up with a solution. I don't know, Angelina, have you seen this? Well, I mean, is, 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 there, is there perhaps some money for Ulster County to subsidize this a little bit? Um, it, it occurs to me that your operation must be subsidized, really. You, you said you composted 2,600 uh, tons of um, uh, compost at uh, $30 per ton over a year. Which is going to net you about seventy thousand uh, or so, basically, and you had two full-time employees that you uh, listed the contact information for. So uh, there must be some subsidy there somewhere or other, basically. Is, is that a question? Yes, it's a question. Yes. Uh, what, what's your subsidy like, and is it available to um, uh, to subsidize programs like this? So our organization does not receive any taxpayer dollars. We're financially self-sustaining through these tip fees that we've established. So, um, you know, there is a cost to grinding the wood waste into wood chips. There's a cost for equipment repairs. I mean, we have a 30 staff of operations. Several of them, you know, deal with the uh, composting operation, the cost of equipment. So some of our expenses relating to like equipment can be offset with the support of grants that we get from New York State in the Environmental um, Protection uh, Environmental Protection Fund through DEC. Um, so we've, you know, had certain opportunities certainly to partner with Ulster County on other initiatives. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned like our compost bagging operation, which we're hoping to launch. Uh, we're a little behind on that from all the chaos of the pandemic. But, you know, when we have the opportunity to access grants that helps provide all of the free education and the services that we are um, offering, but I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question. We certainly have a tremendous cost to process organics into compost, and um, it's not, not we're not offering a free service because we actually lose quite a bit of money on the composting operation. We we do it for the public benefit, um, and oh, of so, course, yes. Yeah, we, we, we're a public benefit corporation, so our process is doing it because we you know, we care and it's for the benefit of the community to do it, but we're certainly not making a lot of money on the compost. No, no, no. I mean, we, obviously we care as well. I was just um, uh, just interested in, because um, uh, David was bringing up the perfectly valid point that to, uh, to, to, you know, to, to get participation, there is actually a perceived expense on the other, the, the restaurant and other providers. Um, um, yeah, uh, I think that David had a good point there. And that's certainly a valid point that there is a perception of the cost, but you know, I would argue that the majority of waste that's generated in a food establishment like a restaurant is organics. So if you're really diverting and having a radical like initiative with zero waste and recycling and composting, you know, I, I've heard of businesses that have eliminated trash altogether and, you know, everything else can be diverted. And, um, I try not to get too jaded by uh, all the concerns. And I think that that is very reasonable, especially for organizations where a lot of their waste is um, organic that can be diverted in other ways. So back Angie, to your yeah. question, Alex, I think that there is a lot that you can do to encourage participation. And I think that you have a wonderful environmental ethos uh, in the community of Woodstock that I think, you know, some focus there would be well received. 
Angelina, I want I don't want you to think for an instant that I am in any way opposed to what you're doing. I, I am wholeheartedly in favor of it. I compost. The only thing I can't compost is is uh, crustacean exoskeletons. I, I, I uh, right now in my garbage can, it's sitting out in the street waiting to be picked up is some clam shells, some shrimp shells and some lobster shells. I can't compost them. All the other all the other things that don't go into my compost heap, I throw into the woods and the animals eat them. And I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm fine with the, whoever's eating the, the meat and the bones and the gristle, eating them and pooping them out. That's great. But, you know, we, we, there's a problem that just needs to be head on addressed and, 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 and fixed. I can't go to the uh, I can't go to any restaurant in town and say and I just it's a little it's not that much money. Just, just spend it. I mean, I, I have restaurant. I, I used to sell wine. So a lot of restaurants here were my customers and I know them and I know what they're I know their, where their hearts are, and I know where their pocketbooks are, and their hearts and their pocketbooks are separated, and there's there's more than six degrees of separation between their hearts and their pocketbooks. I want you, I want you, you Ukra, to help us Woodstock solve the goddamn money problem because that's the that's it. And you pronounce your last name just like a paisan. So Angel, I do, I, I do have one more question, and that is, so if I, I'm back to the homeowner residential thing. So if I wanted to compost in my own yard, um, do you provide instructions for that? Because, you know, I have a garden, so maybe I just take my organic stuff. I can't just throw it in the garden because critters will come and pull it out of the garden. But uh, I guess instructions, maybe that's another thing. And I had a tour of the Mohonk uh, Gardens once, and the gardener said at Mohonk Mountain House, what the restaurant does is they just give all the organic waste to the gardener and the gardener deals with it and it winds up in the garden eventually. So um, I think that's, you know, I don't know if restaurants here have their own garden. A lot of them don't right in the middle of Woodstock, but Mohawk Mountain House has great gardens. And I think that's how, what they do last I knew. Yeah, thanks for your comments and your um, question, Laura. We do provide a lot of education about backyard composting. We have seminars that we offer uh, twice a year that are free to sign up for. We have uh, several resource pages on our website. We have our brochure. We do compost bin sales just this past spring. We sold about 200 um, compost bins to the community uh, over the course of a, uh, one day, which is really great. So um, if you have any questions about backyard composting, and I know sometimes, um, you know, concerns about bears and critters, I'm assuming, especially in Woodstock, you know, your residents have those types of questions as well. We get a lot of that. So I, I like to say that there's a composting option for everyone. And David, if you have crustaceans, you should look into Bokashi. And Laura, if you have bears, you should look into vermicomposting. Um, there are a lot of options to, to deal with these challenges. And I'm confident that you know, as a community, we have the creativity and the the effort to address all of your concerns. So I got um, I questions. got some lobsters in my refrigerator. What was the name of that organization you said I should look into? Oh, David, you should look into Bokashi. It's a fermentation method of composting, and it's a way that you can um, take scraps of food that are problematic, like meat, bones, dairy products. You mentioned lobster shells. And you can actually uh, ferment them down to a point where you can then add them into your compost pile or heat. Spill, spill that for me. Yeah, it's called Bokashi, B-O-K-A-S-H-A-S-H-I. Okay, thank you. I will look into that. So Angelina, thank you so much, first of all. It's so good to see you. Oh, it's my pleasure. In person. In person. Um, so going, I mean, just for us going forward, because like I like you've heard from everyone, this is something that I think has been on the radar here for so long. And it's been like sort of a frustrating thing because we do have the Sogarties Transfer Station and we do kind of partner with them to some extent. And I think we've wanted to expand that for such a long time and it just like doesn't, hasn't happened yet. Um, so trying to be optimistic, do you think that um, for us, the best thing to think about going forward would be something like a community garden, a community space to aggregate some of these things. Like if that was our, if just we were planning ahead, um, or do you think it would be something more like outreach to get other 
organizations to want to join with what you're doing or what some other program is doing? Yeah, well, I'll say this, right? The, the less the waste has to travel to be managed is the way to maximize the environmental impact um, and the environmental benefits. So if there are options to compost on site, then that is the best way to manage your food waste, right? Um, and I'm sensitive to the fact that some residents may live in really you know, wooded areas where they have concerns about bears and things like that. So, so aggregating it into one place where you can manage it effectively um, is, a, is a really great option. And yeah, I would just reiterate that aggregating it into a central location and then taking it from there um, offsite. If, if your goal is residential waste, then that is absolutely, um, you know, what I, what I would recommend. And it all depends on what your goals are with your program, right? Do you want to reach a certain um, level of the community or do you want to reach businesses everywhere? Do you want to reach just um, households in, you know, along a certain route? So those are things that um, as a community, you have to ask those questions because it's that type of planning that's going to be most effective to help you. Um, along the way. And any way that I can be helpful, please know that I'm a resource and I'm literally sitting by the phone uh, waiting for folks to call and, and talk about composting. So I appreciate the conversation and all the good uh, questions tonight as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. And uh, you have my contact information, so I would invite uh, anyone to reach out if you do have any follow-up questions. And if there's no more at this time, I think I will uh, head out and finish my cup of tea. I'll <laughs> <laughs> yeah. put your tea bag in the compost. That was one of the rules. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Did Erin ever make it on? No, huh? No. She said she was having technical problems. There's a lot of power and internet outages today. Hmm. Um, so, so Robert, I would love to, I mean, I, I wanted to talk about the fill law next if we're ready to move on to the next thing or does anyone still have any? I had one, one thing, I put it into chat with them. Uh, <clears throat> it, it seems Socrates already has a, a program in place at their, um, their um, transfer station so they, uh, they, they organize and uh, we, we can kind of participate in it but we're kind of um, uh, on the outside there I mean it's uh, you know David or anybody else who's um, uh, much longer um, uh, on this commission than I am did we ever reach out to the uh, uh, Socrates Town Environmental Commission to see if they um, uh, uh, could open up the program a little bit more and make um, uh, Woodstock residents businesses an official part of that because that's already done. Hmm? done yeah that's a that's a done deal and I think we used to pay them some amount of money too, right? But then now we don't, or we pay them less. No, that's a urban rumor. Oh, well, I heard <laughs> it from someone in this room, so it's like a pretty high up. You heard that from Mary McNamara last last year. Oh, maybe, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that a subscription service that you have to, that you have to pay for the one at the Sawgoody's transfer station? You have to pay for it if you have a if you already are a member there. It's an additional fifteen dollars a year um and if you're not a member i think it's like 30 dollars. you know it's like you pay 30 dollars a year and there's three days you need a permit to use the transfer station that you can drop yeah. off but you can get a compost only permit if you want and it's not very expensive and there's three days that you can do it um obviously the drawback to that is that some people don't want to do it because far to drive and I think for for business larger like a restaurant they're not taking you know they would have to have their own truck and bring it there and then it would go somewhere else mm -hmm. um so I think it's difficult for them but I mean it, it does seem like we just throw out a lot I mean I just I've gone, garden, I've gone to garden cafe and gotten comp gotten scraps from them to put in my garden because I don't make enough food scraps in my house. And, you know, they just have like a street full of food scraps four times a week that could be going yeah. somewhere. Sunflower, sunflower will give you all the or vegetable waste you want. 
Yeah, it just it seems to me that the the waste is appalling, and we um, uh, really would love to do something dearly about it. But this topic's come up um, uh, probably three, four, five times in my uh, fifteen month tenure on this uh, on, on on this commission, and we don't seem to be making any headway. And so I was just kind of throw, trying to throw out a, um, a a creative idea to actually um, yeah make some progress on this. Well, so Socrates, we do kind of partner with. I think the next step would be figuring out either how to get more people to bring something there, um, how to help restaurants be able to bring larger quantities of things there or somewhere. Um, Cause we can, you know, we can take it, it's available. Kingston's a little yeah. bit further. Can I make an announcement now? Yeah, sure. Uh, as part of uh, Woodstock transition or transition Woodstock, they subscribe to the farm festival and have gotten the table assigned to them, I think twice. So I called up Mary McNamara and said, hey, do you want to be on this table with me and, and promote composting in Socrates? And she said, sure. So we're going to have a, some of those brochures that Angelina was talking about, and we'll have a sign, and we'll be promoting the uh, Socrates composting operation at the uh, farmer's market. I can't remember Wednesday we had. Laura, do you think that at the new town offices, when they're finished, that they would like to have a community garden that accepts compost from residents? Well, what well, is it? Well, what? Well, there's a good question. I think that there is a community garden over by the community center. So mm. I think the town does have a community garden. I believe it's over by the community center. Yeah, it's way in the back. I mean, do you know like a that, right? person who does that? Who gardens? I mean, just know. if we wanted to talk to a person at the community garden, does anyone know? Uh, well, I, I can I can ask who the contact is for the community garden because it's Wishock Town property. So, um, so I can ask who we can contact about compost. They have a whole organization, bylaws, and stuff like that. I think you just call the town clerk and get all that. Oh, what is did... it a town entity? Yeah. Yeah, it does have bylaws, like Ken says, but I, I believe it was a town entity. Well, it's, on, it's, on it's on town property. Oh. And having bylaws keeps the trouble out of the town board. They get to solve their own problems. <clears throat> okay, so, so Alex, tell me again, do you want me to ask? See if I can find out about compost there, see I'm if I can sure find out who to ask. If there's a contact there. Well, well I'm sure there's a contact. Um, I just don't know who it is. All right, so I'll Google okay. around a little bit or call well, well, Jeff. Well, I think like Ken said, asking the town clerk would probably know. Right. I would ask Bill McKenna, he would probably know. So, so I mean, I wouldn't Google who the contact is. I mean, you can, if you want me to take an action, I will. I'll ask Jackie or Bill. If you, if I don't have the to-do, if you got the to-do, that's no, fine. I'll call too. Jackie, I'll ask Jackie. Okay, so it's not my to-do, okay. No, no, no. Okay, and I did want to clarify too, Alex, when you said that there was some Woodstock subsidy of the Sorgatis transfer station, my understanding is years ago, Woodstock did subsidize. So I used to take my trash there. I used to pay a lower amount. The amount really skyrocketed up. And I said, why is it cost so much more for an annual permit? And they said, because you're in Woodstock and Woodstock no longer subsidizes. So I think the subsidy did not have to do with the composting per se. I think it had to do with the transfer station itself. And a little tip is if you go to the West Hurley transfer station or the Hurley transfer station rather, it's a lot cheaper actually. So I switched over to there from Solberties. But anyway, that's the subsidy part that I was aware of that Wichita did. Oh, okay. I mean, I think it would be great. I mean, Nick, you have some creative ideas on this, on this matter. Do you want to have some thoughts about ways we can get some restaurant food waste into the right places and maybe I can, I, can, I, can, I can think about it a little bit. It sounds like David's already been down that road um, uh, you know, over the last 10 years several times. So um, uh, I don't know if I can add too much to, uh, to, to that. Can there be a law? Mm. About what? I don't, know if that, I don't think that's the right way to solve it. <laughs> yeah, look, the Ulster County is working on those laws. Just call up Manor Joe Green. She'll give you three hours of background on composting laws. I would rather not do that if I don't have to. But well, yes. <laughs> she, she's very good. Manjo is very good on the She's environment. wonderful. Yes. The history of composting in Ulster County. <laughs> you haven't heard <laughs> No, I just, I walk by those bags of, of 
you know, scraps all the time, and it's like so. so they're, I mean, they're pot. They're the county is is passing laws requiring composting, and there's you know they're starting off with the big organizations you know, like the prison, uh, like the uh, the schools and the and the major supermarkets yeah. and things was, like that. Yeah, and that as, as time goes on, they'll 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 lower that bar so it gets down to lower groups. Yeah, oh, you have to compost. The, the, those, these rules won't apply to uh, households and smaller one-off restaurants. I don't think ever. Because like, like you say, they're starting large with the big institutions. And um, uh, so I've, I've, I've seen about um, some details on this. So it's... Um, I think the one thing that was really intriguing that um, Angelina was talking about was having a, a religious organization, church, synagogue, whatever, or something like that, uh, have a composting facility or, or at least a compost collection point on site. The problem that you know, I went to the to the um, maintenance department a, a year or two ago. Uh, oh, it was pre-COVID, so it must have been two years ago. To talk to them about whether we could bring, uh, whether we could establish a composting facility at some town location, and they said that they they had tried that at the um, uh, at their building. You know, the, the garage building up on on the top of the Camo, and they ran into constant problems. One of them being the source separation, and another one being securing um, the compost from the bears, uh, which are frequent visitors and love the food. Um, and so, so it's just a, so, you know, you can lock it up, but then how does the resident get in? How do you make sure it's only for residents or do you care? And then how do you ma maintain uh, the purity of the, uh, of the compost? Bill, talk, Bill told me a couple of years ago that if we found a way, if we could make sure that the compost was was really good compost, meaning not contaminated, he could find a location for us. And I, I believe he can, but we're going to have to have someone there full time to make sure that Woodnicks are not throwing in their garbage or the refrigerators or whatever the hell. Well, David, what you what you said sounds interesting, which is having a, a religious institution, let's say, doing it. I mean, I suppose there's a way where you could do it where all of the places that are brick, we would restrict it to only places where we know someone had been watching it. Does that make sense? Well, as my old landlady, landlady in uh, Brooklyn would have put it, there's a lot of work with a compost heap. I mean, it's just a lot of work. It's not. It's not as simple as oh, it's just take the, the vegetables out and throw them. I mean, that's what I do in my garden. I take my vegetables out and I throw them into a big pile, and eventually they'll get there. But, but in other words, like if every Sunday someone went to church and brought their compost and it was watched there, and then they brought all of that to this second location in town that Bill finds for us, we would know that what was brought to that location was not contaminated. And imagine you pray would this possible that scenario is. i like i like i like putting the responsibility onto churches and and religious institutions because they don't pay taxes so they need to start giving back you know time i'm gonna just take a couple of buckets of compost out to Socrates. they can just bless it for us and, it'll, and, and it'll see how that whole process works before you start <laughs> sending other places all right should we go on to the phil law yes um robert i liked bob i liked the changes they excellent yeah made. they were so good La laura i don't know if you were on that email um she was. bob made some notes on the phil law that bill sent to me to send oh, okay. to everyone um would bob would you like us should we go do we think we should, should we go just go ahead and pass that along? Like, yeah, I mean, good sure. about that? I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that. I mean, Laura, just for your advocation, I added a reference to the, um, the DER 10, the environmental, the mm -hmm. environ, environmental regs on the definition of clean fill. Okay. So that, that was the gist of it. And Bob, I, I asked you a question about an hour or so ago in an email about where you came up with the numbers that you used. Yeah, I didn't understand. What do you mean numbers? You mean well, you use numbers like uh, gradients or uh, depth of fill or height of uh, something. No, like I didn't, that wasn't mine. That was in there. 
Okay. So I'll see it when it goes to Bill, I guess, right? Because you, know, you said you, I wasn't on it. And so I'll just wait till I get it from when Bill sends it around. Yeah. I mean, are we good with that? You send it, yeah, send it up? All right. Cool. Okay. Okay. I, I did have an update if you wanted about the court case. Yeah. Okay. So Oops. Bill just this afternoon, late this afternoon, sent an email to the town board, heard from the town's attorney that Vince uh, did show up at court without lawyers and asked for more time. And Carolus's attorney had the wrong date on his calendar and totally missed the court date. And the judge granted a, a one month extension. So the new court date is, is a month out, uh, unfortunately so. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, and then he also said the state attorney general has decided not to include this case with the state's case against Carolus. So the state obviously has a case against Carolus, but they're not gonna roll this into the state's case. So things are being postponed, but that's the judge's decision. And Bill, as Bill describes this, this is a criminal case. I did talk to Bill after our meeting before about the attendee who said, uh, hey, you know, I've got some video footage. Uh, this is a criminal case. Anybody that has evidence, it would be great to give it to the lawyer because, uh, you know, it's, it's important to have all the information for the case. So, Bob, what I was talking about was uh, Section 5, uh, subsec, Section A, 1, 2, and 3, where there are, there's a, a apparently amendment language that for, in one, it's with slopes in excess of 2.5 height to yeah. volume. I, it was yours, yours or someone else's? No, that, that wasn't me. That was already in the copy okay. that we received. Right. Great. Okay. Well, you. Are your markups in like a red or something so everybody knows what your markups are? Yes. Okay. Those numbers actually were in red, but. Yeah. Hence my <laughs> Those were mine. Wait, the, they were yours? No, they, they weren't mine. Uh, okay. Okay, fine. All right. And I did speak to, um, God, now I don't even remember when this happened, but I spoke to Bill, I think since we had our last meeting, and I know that one of the issues that had come up um, was the interpretation of some of the, who was able to um, be in charge, God, I'm brain dead today, sorry who's in charge of like, can Ellen, you know, do this or can she not do this? And does she have say over this and not? And I think there was a question at some point over whether the law was being interpreted by Bill himself versus what some other opinions of the interpretation were. Um, and he did clarify to me and said that he would send something from the town attorney to us, um, that that was the attorney's interpret not, a reading of the law it wasn't an opinion based on like his opinion versus someone yeah and i actually have that and let me dig that out and send that along alex i i have that so um, just to update you guys because i know there was some talk about like who's well yeah, yeah who's deciding this and apparently it's the lawyer and he will let us know that Yes, I, I, I will. I will send you the copy of that because Bill did send that to the town board, and I do have a copy of that because that was Aaron who brought that up before about we had he said she said Aaron said here's what I think, and I was explaining what I thought Bill thought, and Bill did get the attorney to weigh in, so I will forward the, the attorney's words. I, I I do have that, and I'll forward that. Okay. Do you want me to forward it to you, Alex, or to the whole WEC? I can forward you. If you oh, don't okay. want to find all the email addresses, I can forward it. Okay, I think they're they're in most. Uh, I'll send it to you that way. It's coming from you. So. All right. Okay. Okay. So the critical environmental areas. We had a meeting yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday. yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, does someone else want to talk about it, Julia or Arlene, who was there? Just give an update. Well, it was the first meeting. Uh, we're going to. It's the first of five. Um, and so they were pretty much laying out the definitions of what is a critical environmental area. And we had some preliminary discussion of uh, what we what areas we thought we might want to cover, what we, we might want to include. And Alex had a useful way of, of breaking out the, the various uh, possibilities into three buckets. And those were, Alex, do you remember what your buckets were? 
Oh, they weren't mine. They, I think they were just what they do. But one, one was like historical features or like cultural features. One is, um, has hazard or hazard prone areas just... and one, is, you know, eco lot, ecologically beneficial areas or, right. you know, just good ecosystems here. So we did want to start maybe by narrowing some of that down. I mean, she said she thought we would do a lot of the talking about it just offline. Mm. Um, so I suppose, you know, if there's anyone here who also has opinions that wants to chime in, feel free to send it in an email, which is how I think most of that is going to be going. Can we yeah, see what we've already I, I done? We... I'm sorry, Arlene. No, I was just saying, I think that we have talked a little bit more about it because I, I, I'd like to see something that we choose or two things, because she said we could do two, um, where it's got really long-term effects. I mean, if we're going to choose something, it should, it should be, this is for perpetuity, whatever we're doing, you know, and we should consider that environmental uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Historical would be nice too, but if the historical environmental could mix, that would be pretty great. Um, I just don't know where that happens in Woodstock. Yeah. I'm wondering if the planning board could be more of a, uh, a source for what we choose because with the um, huge subdivisions coming up, they are aware of what, I mean, because of their mapping, they must know where the, the really large parcels are that could be subdivided. And those are the flags, right? Those are the red flags for us, I would imagine. Anything that's gonna affect the interruption of a large forest in Woodstock up yeah. on a mountain is a major, major ecological problem. Right. I mean, you're starting to talk about um, creating streams where they're not because of poor roads. Mm -hmm. In the future, um, septics going where they shouldn't. There's so much that you have to consider. I mean, this this is what I used to do, you know. But it's like mm -hmm. this is what we have to look at for the rest of Woodstock. Where do we want to really protect land? The other thing I thought about that I thought was really interesting. She said about was the wetland areas and maybe doing an area around the wetlands east Woodstock because that's something people don't consider protecting enough. Right, and also in just increasing the buffers and in, in order, th there's a lot of land that's already protected. And the idea is how do you increase that? What are some strategies to increase right. that? And then maybe uh, create a corridor for um, wildlife. Do we think it's worth reaching out to Brent who helped do the climate resiliency tool because he's been taking a look at the maps and he has been looking at what they're going to look like in a number of years <clears throat> from now, right? And and seeing maybe where some of those problems, Arlene, that you're talking about might be coming up that we're not seeing because we're not like looking at it going forward. I think that's a great idea. And that's, I, you know, I was not very verbal, verbally correct in my meeting, in the meeting the other day. But what I was trying to say is there, there's parts of Woodstock that we, we haven't dealt with. Um, erosion problems, we don't deal with at all. These are areas that we not only have to protect, but we have to deal with them. And... I don't know, that might be a critical environmental area. The stream, again, the stream buffers, what you're talking about, Julia, yeah. are so important. And yes, the stream buffers are protected in the watershed, but they are not protected outside of the watershed, which is really apparent right in town where they've built these ugly ass things right in town, right by the stream. Excuse me, but they're really ugly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it really bothers me um, that they could do something like that. Well, what was interesting about considering increasing the buffers was that we already have the watershed law. And so we could tweak that law. And then it's, it's the, the problem with the CAA is it's not binding, but this would be binding, you know, right. the law, so. And that's what she was saying, leading to something that could be binding. Right. Right. So I, I just, I think there's a lot of opportunities, but I think talking to Brent would be a really good idea. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll send him an email because he, he's been through all of this. He might have some good suggestions. Right. Um, okay. Aaron's not here, but Ken, do you have a see a climate smart update you want to share? Yeah, we got a, a response to our, uh, our submission. It got a little confusing and we decided not to accept the response. Uh, so if you go on, you won't see any changes to what, uh, what has happened to what we submitted, but this is what happened. Uh, you know, we, we submitted a half dozen updates. Uh, we submitted the, the pollinator pathway. Uh, they really liked that. I thought that was going to be sort of a long shot, but they really liked the pollinator pathway. Uh, we submitted a community greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, they liked the inventory, but what's, but it's really up to the environmental commission to publicize it. And so they didn't give us that they didn't give us the points because we didn't make it public. On LED streetlights, for some reason, we dropped from 10 points to four. And I don't have an explanation for that, although I sent a letter off to uh, Dazzle to, to find out what the deal is. On the uh, geothermal installation, they changed the criteria there and they added heat pumps, which was a reasonable thing. They didn't have heat pumps uh, before and that, and that way we get to submit the uh, community center as a as, a, as an operation, and which I've, I already have done that. Uh, the natural resource inventory got full credit for that, uh, the full 10 points. Uh, this is where we had the problem with reduced greenhouse gases from government facilities. We had that all calculated out. Uh, we were going to claim 40 points. Then they said, oh, we changed those rules. <laughs> I said, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> and uh, so we won't accept these results. We'll, uh, we'll recalculate them and resubmit. Uh, so they, we had to add in the, uh, in the uh, municipal street lighting, uh, which we did. The other thing that happened while we were uh, in the process of the review is that uh, the EPA came out with new uh, emission factors for the grid based on, you know, the next the 2019, which was the following year, which dropped our grid electricity by about 8% as far as uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And we use an awful lot of electricity in these in these buildings with the geothermal and the and the uh, and the air heat pumps and the, and the, now with the uh, uh, municipal lighting, uh, so that took that pushed us across the uh, uh, the forty percent drop in greenhouse gas emissions from two thousand eleven, which would max us out as far as points on uh, on getting uh, greenhouse getting credit for dropping greenhouse gas emissions. On government vehicles, we applied for 15 points and we, uh, we we obtained 15 points. So these are the things I was working on and I've submitted in the changes all except, you know, for the publicity and the PR, but, but I'll leave that up to the, the Environmental Commission. But this stuff is now, you know, we're, we're ready to go with these updates uh, for the July submission. Now what else Aaron wants to do, I, I have no idea. And what's what's beyond you know what I've been working on, what other people have been working on, or what else might be available. And in terms of the um, spreading the word, getting it out to the public, would that be through social media? I mean, if we I think so. Yeah, you know, I would. Just you know, a, between a now and, and July, post, I think that's right? our only only venue is to put it on Facebook, right? Yeah, Instagram. Yeah. Ken, do you have the actual information that we need to share? Oh yeah. Can you send it in a in a palatable to the public format? Well, I can send you the document that's only a couple of pages long. You just paste that on the Facebook and with a paragraph. Is there potentially a way to distill that into some shorter talking points if we were gonna like put it on Instagram or something? where people can't read like long, like are there just a few important numbers that maybe you could underline? Well, I don't know if they actually have to read it. We just have to demonstrate it's been posted. Well, it would be nice if people <laughs> well, got it. Yeah. <laughs> I say that about all own, my reports. <laughs> points, for his, points for his own sake. Um, yeah, Ken um, and, and Alex, if you, if you want to send it to me, I'll, uh, I'll have a go at summarizing. 
Okay. Like, Thanks, I, mean, I, could, I, I, could, I could definitely do that. It, it's not actually very complicated. No, 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 no. I know. All I did was copy it from data that was 10 years old. I actually came from 2010. And they said, yeah. well, this is just fine, but you haven't told anyone about it. Yeah. Well, Ken, I think there's a reason they want us to share this kind of information, which is to educate the public and encourage them to participate in these kind of activities. Yeah, well, so, that, there's a whole long just, list of uh, Share it in a way that's easy for them to understand. Yeah, um, if we have to edit it down to uh, three or four posts and um, uh, post something every uh, every few days, every week for a month or two, basically, then that's some uh, that, that's good too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't think anyone reads this stuff, but the, uh, I mean, we're, we're supposed to do uh, demonstrations at the community center with the heat pumps and at the, the uh, with the, the geothermals at the highway garage and the, uh, uh, the town hall. You know, we haven't done any of that stuff. It's supposed to be holding educational sessions. I mean, we got a whole long, every, every item has some sort of education format that you're supposed to do and we're just going yeah, i'm just throwing up stuff that we did 2015 2016 library presentations well ken since I, this is, I feel like this is the first that i'm hearing about a lot of those things and potentially some other people here as well yeah. um and i know aaron's not here but maybe there's a way that we can come up with a list of, I mean, we have a few opportunities that we're going to be talk. I mean, this I have, well, I have this lower on the list, but for outreach, we're going to have the farmer's market, we're going to have our Earth Day thing, we have social media, yeah. like, let's think of some of these things that we need to have some outreach about. Maybe you can send us a list of the things you know of. And, you know, Erin can let us know about the things she knows of, and we can make sure to include some of that. Stuff. Well, the one thing that's that's holding us up at this point <laughs> for 15 points is the uh, community greenhouse gas inventory. Just because no one knows about it? Well, I, I actually, when I did this, I sent out the inventory to all the, the entire WEC. Yeah. But it's just a matter of, you know, we have to publicize it. Yeah. Okay, so let's Nick do it. says we'll just put it on Facebook, and that's the least. It's not that big of a deal. Just we'll put it on Instagram. Market. Yeah. Before July and take a picture, I think we're home free. Yeah, we just need to know the things that we need to be sharing with people because I don't think we all know what we need to be sharing. Well, that's, you know, the, the, <laughs> the task force coordinator sort of has that role. To, well, she's, yeah, well, we're getting the, she's not here tonight. <laughs> not here, so it's all on you. All and, right. this is, <laughs> and this is, the, you know, this is the response we've had after two weeks of, of submission. I mean, they, they've been two weeks, months of review. They've come back and said, you know, if they had said, well, we'll accept this, even though you haven't done the publicity, I, I wouldn't have said anything. Right. So, and for clean energies, um, the clean energy thing, I got the letter of commitment from Bill. I'm resubmitting the grant application. Um, I don't foresee there being a problem, but the good news is that the energy audit is happening at the youth center. June 11th and June 18th from 8.30 to 12.30. Mm -hmm. Both of those Fridays. Um, I'm going to be there. I technically should be at work for some of those hours. So if anyone else is available any of that time and wants to step in at some point, feel free. Otherwise, I'll definitely be there the whole time. So who's um, doing the energy audit, Alex? So it's very exciting. Do you remember that I was talking about a program like a few months ago that um, the Citizens for Local Power does where they do these like green jobs internships with people from lower income yeah. communities. So Ken hooked us up with Jessica Clegg at Citizens for Local Power. And she was like, oh my God, we are teaching an energy audit for the next month and we would love to use your building as an example and we bring these paid interns in and someone who's an expert at it walks them through it and it's like a whole teaching demonstration so if anyone is interested um in coming it'll be you know she's going to be explaining how the whole thing works which is why it takes longer um, than usual so we get the free energy audit 
Um, all of these people get the training that they get paid for to go out and get green jobs. Cool. Yeah. We oh, should, sorry, what's what's, what's the, the name time? of the entity? So it's, it's called the Green Jobs Initiative, and it's through Citizens for Local Power. Alex, send me, send me the times. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I mean, send it to everyone, please. Though. I'll send it to everyone, but I just confirmed it this morning with Jackie and, and um, I think his name is Alan, right. who is the... And we should be taking photos and yeah. documenting because that could go on Instagram and that's a really, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, really a terrific program. Yeah. We'll get a lot of points. For this. And this is right on, you know, what the, what the governor is doing and what the... Uh, county executive is doing. This is worth a lot. Did you ever hear from uh, Bill and Melinda? They're going through some stuff right now, Ken. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I didn't. Check? Okay. And, uh, uh, all right. Did you hear from so, Judith? No. She was going to call you. No. I mean, maybe she called me from like a weird number and didn't leave a message and I didn't answer. Well, yeah, she's that, also if that happened to me, I think Bill called me from a cell phone and I didn't recognize the number, so I let, let it go. And, and I, I don't think, I, you know, didn't leave a message that I should try calling him back. Um, involved but, with the, uh, the, the Citizen for Local Power in the same program. I don't know what her involvement is, but she's somehow or another connected to it. So she may be involved without. All right. Well, I'm really excited about about this, um, and it means that we get to use the money towards actually doing some of the things that they recommend instead of paying for the audit, which is also great. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, okay. So outreach. I just like lumped everything together because um, we have the farmers market Earth Day. I mean, this brochure that we've been talking about forever. Um, one thing that I have been thinking for the farmer's market, because we keep coming up with all these questions and we like don't know what people think about them. Do we want to come up with some kind of like a survey for people to fill out? We need at the market? At the farmer's market for our, as one of the things at our booth, you know, like if we're like, oh, we really wish people wanted to compost, like maybe we want to ask some questions like, would you do, do this? Would you do this? Do you want to see this happening? So, so Alex, what is your role at the farmer's market? Because as you know, I was there a week ago and saw you there and it was wonderful. Um, but are you always there or is that a WEC table or are you part of the farmer's market itself? No. So I donate money through my business to the farmer's market, which means I have a connection with them. And so because of that, I agreed to volunteer last year when oh. they were looking for volunteers to like keep the market running during COVID. Right. Because I kind of felt like just throwing money at someone isn't really like an effective yeah. way of being yeah. helpful. So oh. I just go and I'm there usually most Wednesday Wednesdays like helping out. But because I'm no, Sophie, who's the market manager, she said that this year they're doing a table each week for like a local outreach. And she asked mm -hmm. if the WEC wanted to have one. Oh, uh, so it wouldn't be at the table where you sit as a volunteer. It would be nope. a separate table. Yeah. So the first table in every week is a different this today. It was the housing, um, the housing committee. It was a wet day. It was very soggy today. It's always rains on Wednesdays, but so we get a table and we can just use it for whatever we want, um, outreach cool. to the community. So we've been trying to brainstorm some things we might want to educate them about, but I, I, don't, I wonder if there are things we might want to know from them that we might get answers to while they're walking by potentially. So that was just something that came. And that, that's the same story with the uh, Woodstock transition table. You know, they donated money to the Farm Festival and got a table, and that's where we're going to do Mary McNamara. Oh, right. Well, normally I get a table for the store, but I hate it because it's annoying, so I don't do it. So you can also donate it to someone else. But this is an unrelated, they're just like two separate things. This is just because she wanted to know if we wanted to do this separately. Um, so... 
if anyone has any thoughts about that. So it's July 21st. That, that's the day of when the, this table for WEC, if there is a WEC table, it'll be July 21st. It is July 21st at the farmer's market, week seven. We can bring, if we want to talk about, you know, we could bring some of the compost information. We could bring the Earth Day information. We talked about in the CEA meeting yesterday that we might want to um, have some information about the CEAs. Yeah. But well, no, 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 normally on these meetings, you say, oh, brochure, oh, Nick's not here. We can't cover it. Nick is here. So I wonder whether that segues. <laughs> I know Nick for like two months we've been <laughs> putting off the brochure and you missed the news that it's not, and now it's old news and it probably isn't even happening but like at some point there was some talk about like a town-wide brochure of like the leash law and the bear information and the something so I was going to say maybe you should look into just giving those people a few tidbits. Um, but is there anything that you might have wanted to put in the brochure that hasn't happened yet that that might be good as a farmer's market and or Earth Day display? And the brochure is something uh, that I haven't thought about for exactly the same reasons I haven't been able to attend these meetings and that kind of thing because I've just been mad, mad, mad busy doing um, um doing my day job. <laughs> Mostly, it's climbing down a little bit now, so that's um, uh, that, that's uh, that, that, that's good. So I'll um, I'll give that some thought. I mean, there are a couple of things that I thought were um, uh, you're kind of just missing from the original green guide that would have um, uh, that would have been good to bring up. And um, um, so. okay, well, just so you know, Nick, there is interest town wide amongst other groups as well for mm. doing a similar project because there's frustration that new homeowners, renters, Airbnbers are coming here and are like not knowing a lot of the rules mm -hmm. um, that went beyond just what we had been talking about. So at some point when you have a little bit more time, it might make sense to reach out to a few people to see if there's some sort of collaborative uh, you know, you might be able to just give them a few things that you're thinking of and have them include it in this larger project that I don't know for sure is happening, but it's, it's. All right. And so this would, this would specifically be uh, oriented towards new residents and familiarizing them with them. Um, Cause we've talked about this a little bit as well, your kind of bear awareness and, um, and what the recycling programs actually do and, uh, you know, kind of other things like that basically. So, um, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll start thinking about it from with, with that angle. Well, thank you. So, Alex, if I may, some ideas that I was just kind of thinking of. If you were to have a, a and, and of course you have time to think about between now and July 21st, but if you had a WEC table. We are um, having, we are 100% yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, given, given you are having a table, uh, some beginning brainstormings that I might have on what information you may provide at it. One is good environmental habits because that may sound like it was without saying, but I think that it doesn't go without saying. I learned things by attending these meetings and, he, and I went to a luncheon at the community center and sat next to David Gross and he brought his own, instead of using a paper plate, he brought his own, uh, you know, bring along plate from home that he just washes and reuses. I mean, there's some really good habits that this committee has and maybe brainstorming what they are and just so that that's a list of things you might provide to people. What are good environmental habits? Um, one of them that you may want to share is what has the WEC accomplished? I mean, huge accomplishments, you know, the CSC and going to the higher level and the being uh, carbon neutral, which was several years ago that Ken knows all about because he was pretty key in that. So uh, you may want to sell the WEC a little bit because you guys have really done some fabulous things. Yeah, you, know, you weighed in on Dan Scammer, you, um, you know, you got very involved. There's just a lot of stuff that you have done. So those are my two thoughts is, good habits to be environmentally conscious and uh, selling yourself a bit because this committee has done some great things. Maybe we should hand out some of that grant money. That'll give us some good uh, publicity. <laughs> I think it comes in Power to the people. <laughs> we have to uh, rip up the check. That's the money David was talking about. He said money, yeah, he said, <laughs> money works. Bunch of dollar bills. <laughs> 
All right. And then is there anything else about the farmer's market or Earth Day that Aaron's not here, so we can't talk too much about Earth Day. Um, so the only really new business- Wait, 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 Alex. Yeah. Um, Earth Day is actually amazingly coming up on us real fast. Yes. It's less than two months. Have you um, have you designated Erin as the, the person in charge of the she, whole world? Yes, she has been yes. in charge of Earth Day for many, at least the past two years. And she, she is, she's in charge. she's in charge of it this year as well. And as we discussed, there was some sentiment that we didn't want to all have to discuss it, I think coming from you. Um, so, so she has sort of been off, you know, booking the things and she has a whole spreadsheet that she uses and Good. So that's great. And and I'm, I think that's exactly the right way to do it. What I'm going to ask you to do is to make sure that she maintains a very clear chain of command. You should be managing her and, and she should be managing the rest of us. And one of the things I want to make sure of is that no one steps on other people's toes. For example, if if Erin wants me to be in charge of getting EV uh, EVs there to show off to, to people, um, I, I'd be delighted to take that on. But that that's her call but what i don't want is if i'm taking on the getting evs there i don't want julia to say oh you know i know the nissan the um leaf uh the leaf dealer and let me take let me just call them up and uh ask them to bring a leaf there i'd love to have a leaf there but i don't want julia going off on her own and saying let me do that i want julia to come to me and say david I'd i know the leaf dealer should i call him up and um and, and invite them. And I would say, of course, say yes. But I want, I, I think it makes a lot of sense for there to be very clear lines of communication and authority. That's all I have to say on that. So if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. Okay. It keeps That's a like spreadsheet that, you know, so she needs to share her spreadsheet and she needs to also ask us to help her. You know, we need to have that conversation sooner than later. David's absolutely right because. This will be right on top of us and we won't be ready. So. And the date, just so you guys know, is the 31st of July and it's at the community center. Yeah, I am unfortunately out of town. I, this doesn't revolve around me, I know, but I am out of town on that day, which I'm sorry to say, because I would love to be there for it. Alex is gone. You know, vaporized. Oh, sorry. 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 I had to <laughs> do something to my husband and the door was locked. Um, okay. So, so David, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Erin to start an email and, and she can share, divide out and share. And yeah. And then the new business is not very much. Um, just to remind everyone that June 8th is the public hearing for the building moratorium. Um, right. I know we had all made some comments that Laura sent Forwarded. back, I believe, to Bill. Um, it's June 8th at 7.15 at the community center. So if anyone um, wants to be there, it's in person. Um, and it's next Tuesday evening. So, and I don't actually, I've never been to one of these, so I don't know how it works. And like, if we would have an opportunity to say something or if there's a list or like, I, I don't know. So you probably all know better than I do how that. Do you, do you, do you want me to answer? Yeah, sure. Okay. Usually a public hearing is for the public to speak. Um, sometimes a public hearing, nobody speaks and it's really quick. Sometimes for public hearing, the room is full and everybody wants to speak. In a full room, Bill tends to go, you know, first row, everybody speaks, second row, everybody speaks. He gives everybody a time limit. And then if you want to say more, he'll go around the room again. So the idea of a public hearing is the public does speak. It's not like when you go to a town board meeting and five speakers get two minutes each and you're done. It's not like that because it's a public hearing. It's a topic and the purpose is to hear from the public. So everybody will get to speak. They can't speak forever, but they do get everybody will get two minutes and they'll usually get a shot at another two minutes if they, you know, have more to say after everybody's spoken. But when you never know till you get there, will nobody speak? Will everybody speak? Yeah, we don't know yet. All right, well, it might be interesting for some of us to hear what the, especially, you know, we talked, well, we talked about it in the CA meeting, but um, 
to hear what the thoughts of the town are because eventually we're going to be presenting some of those things to the town. So mm -hmm. just maybe to hear what, what people are thinking. Um, although, I mean, Laura, like you sent all of those comments on anyway, right? So, yes. so our yes. voice has been heard, but if we wanna go. Because um, yeah, the, the issue isn't entirely an environmental issue, is it? There are a lot no. of other issues at stake here, which I, I feel deeply about and that kind of thing, and uh, would love to have my say, but probably outside of the context of this organization, because we're the environmental group. Yeah, but, well, you can certainly come and speak to whatever you want, you know, hmm. on the moratorium, because you're 100% correct, it's more than just environmental, so every citizen of Woodstock is welcome to, welcome to come in and comment on whatever aspect of it you choose to comment on. Yeah, you can go to the, I mean, I don't think we would be going as, as us, but I'm just letting you guys know that it's, right. if we want to go, and it, it sometimes is interesting just to know what other people have in mind, because. Yeah, I I'll, I'll just point out, I found about this, I found out about this today on Facebook, because it was posted in the, um, uh, on our page, so the, um, uh, the outreach and social media does work. We can. <laughs> Does anyone know if it's going to be televised? You know, normally they are, but we this is our first in-person meeting for like 14, 15 months. So normally Thomas has been our videographer. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be surprised if it's not televised, but it's a really good question. I'll, I'll ask Bill if it's if we have te the televising, if, if we have the recording set up. Uh, and there's televising is two things. I, I don't know if it'll go out live, but usually Thomas records and then it can go out later on a carousel. All right, so guys, I, anything else from any, that anyone? Uh, I did send you that email already, Alex. Oh, so, yeah, I have it right here. So I, I'll let you forward it to the committee and I, and I copied Bill so he knows you've already got it. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, yeah. It is 8.39, I'm officially calling this meeting closed and I will see you guys in two weeks at the town offices. Live, yes. In person. In person. <laughs> um, that, that was gonna be my question after the uh, the thing. Did I miss an announcement about in-person meetings? And um, uh, the answer is, yeah, I did. And we're doing the next one. Oh the yeah. yeah, it's going to be back where it used to be. Mm -hmm. Hi right, everyone, we'll lobsters call. Back. Um, and David's okay. written a couple of bottles of wine for us. I don't know what the mask situation is. Absolutely. Actually. Well, I think we follow CDC guide. That, that's a good question. I don't know if you want to ask Bill, but yeah, I think we follow CDC guidelines because the CDC guidelines say if you're double vaccinated and you're socially distanced, you don't need to wear a mask. So the question is, do you want to socially distance when you're in the room? Um, but I, I, most people I know are double vaccinated. I know I am. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right, cool. See you guys in a Adios. couple weeks in person. Bye. Bye. Bye.